Good morning. I want to welcome you all here for worship this morning. We're so glad you could join us on a beautiful Sunday morning. I want to invite you to stand to your feet. As we, as we gather this morning, as we lift our hearts in worship, as we enjoy being together as a body and being in the presence of God, I just want to invite you to join me in prayer. God, we just thank you, Lord, for, for this day. God, the sun is shining. God, we see, God, the beauty of your creation. God, we see your, your goodness and your grace all around us, God, in so many ways, Lord. God, so as we, as we gather to worship today, God, as we come together, God, in your house with your people, God, may your spirit just be here with us. God, may you lift us up. May you encourage us. God, may you, God, just comfort us. May you surround us, God, with your love. And may you, God, receive all the honor and glory through our worship today. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's go ahead and take a minute, greet those around you, and then we'll open with some worship. Because I can't ever greet. Show your mighty hand, heal our 
I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me.
to us, Lord, is we're your children and you love us. So, Lord, let this house be a house of your praise this morning, Lord. Let us worship your name and your name alone. Let us not be distracted. Let us be focused. Let us be made new in your name, Lord. And, Lord, let us just worship you through song, through your word, and, Lord, through our fellowship, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. And any preschool kids, you are free to be dismissed for Bible Adventures today. We're going to transition into a time of of giving of our tithes and offerings. And while we do this, uh, my my hope is just that our minds would be focused on the Lord. Our minds not be focused on, on all the things that could be going on in our life, but that our mind is focused on the generous spirit of who God is and what he has done for us. We, we serve such a generous Lord, a Lord that gives so, so much to us, and if we may just be able to give a fraction of ourselves back to him this morning, what a blessing that would be. So they're going to pass the plate here in a moment, and Barb Hoffman's going to serenade us with some music, and while, while that's happening, my, my hope is that you would, just, you would just offer yourself to the Lord, you would offer yourself spiritually, physically, mentally, that you would just allow the Lord to, to use you as an instrument in his hand. So the plates are going to pass. 
And I just want to pray over that offering. If you would just pray with me one more time. Dear Heavenly Lord, we just, we just pray, God, that this offering be used for your glory. Lord, simply put, that you use this offering to advance your kingdom, Lord. Lord, may we be a part in that work. May we be a part in what you're doing in this church, in this community, in, the, in this world, Lord. May we be a part by giving just a little bit of our lives back, Lord. You've given us so much. You've blessed us with so much, Lord. So, Lord, we just pray that this offering, that it please you, that it honor you, that it, that it, that it move this community, Lord, towards you. Lord, you are our sole purpose. You're our sole hope, Lord. We praise you and we offer all things in your name, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Barb, for playing for us this morning. I want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer as we get ready to hear from God's word this morning. God, we just thank you uh, for the opportunity, God, just to hear from your word, God, to uh, listen to what it has to teach us, God, to be reminded from it of how much you love us, Lord. And God, I pray that as we do that, God, that you would just open our ears, that you'd open our hearts. But also, God, just help us just to see um, where you are and what you're doing, God, in our lives. God, for some of us this morning, God, we're coming here um, with hurt, with pain, with confusion, maybe with doubt, with fatigue. And God, may we, God, just hold to the promise, God, that no matter what we experience in this life, God, that nothing can separate us from your love. May we, God, just be reminded today, God, that you're always with us, that you watch over us, God, and that you love us. And God, that your love pursues us, Lord, each and every day. And I pray, God, that we would know that uh, more deeply as we worship you this morning. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 
So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Ruth chapter 4. So we're finishing our series looking at the book of Ruth this morning by looking at the last chapter, chapter 4. There's also an outline uh, in your bulletins this morning that you can use to kind of follow along with the message today. And in Ruth 4, we see the story really kind of accelerate. We really see the action kind of pick up a lot. And that really starts at the end of Ruth chapter 3, where we see this verse right at the end, Ruth 3 verse 18, that says this. The man, talking about Boaz, will not rest until the matter is settled today. So the matter we're talking about, if you weren't here last week, is that Boaz is a close relative of a man named Elimelech who died, along with his two sons, Malan and Kilian, and one of their widows named Ruth is been caring for her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Boaz has realized that he is a close relative of hers, so it is his responsibility to seek to carry on the family name and the ancestry of Elimelech. But he knows that there's another person who is actually a closer relative than his. So where we left off in Ruth 3 is Boaz is going to find this individual to find out if this person will do what needs to be done to redeem Elimelech's name, to provide a heir for his inheritance, or if he won't, then Boaz has said, I will do this, I will step in, I will be this guardian redeemer for Elimelech, for his family, for his client, and for Ruth as he would join her in marriage, and then they, by God's grace, would have a child that can carry on the family name. But one of the things that we see here in Ruth 4 is the connection between names and redemption, or more specifically, the name and a redeemer. So how many of you know what your name means? Have any of you ever figured that out? You have your first name, your last name, you have an idea of what your name means. Some of you do, not many of you. How many of you, though, think of a title that you have? Titles like husband, wife, mother, father, brother, sister. And there's all kinds of them that we have, right? Do you think about what it means for you to have that title? to have that name attached to you. My guess is you do. My guess is if you're a parent, you strive to be the best father or mother that you can be, and you work together in order to provide the best home that you can for your children. If you're married, you try to be the best husband or wife that you can be, to be the best spouse you can be for your partner so that you can have a healthy whole marriage. What about a friend? My guess is you all have ideas of what a friend looks like or should be, right? No matter how little you are, you understand what it means to be a good friend, right? To share, to be kind, to be caring, to be compassionate. We see these connections between names and what we do. But in Ruth, we see this connection between name and redemption. And in Ruth specifically, we see redemption involving the restoration of a name to an inheritance. So in this case, it's the restoration of Elimelech's name to his inheritance. Not just the physical inheritance of land and of possessions, but also of a child that can carry on the name. Because it was customary in those days, as we talked about, if a man would die without having a relative of the next generation that a close relative would then marry into the family, in order to provide that for them. But let's look at how this also carries out in the wider parallel of redemption we talked about last week. We see this particular story in Ruth about redemption point to the bigger story of God's redemption. That's what we've been doing the last four weeks. Look at this from Acts 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is what? No other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I'm going to give you the easiest question you're going to get all morning. What's the name that's being talked about here? There's no name under heaven. What's the name? There you go, Jesus, right? Our Redeemer is Jesus. There's salvation found in no other name other than the name of Jesus, given to mankind by which we must be saved. Or check this out, Romans 10, verse 13. Paul writes this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus, 
will be saved. There's this connection between the name of Jesus and the redemption that we have as Christians. Our Redeemer has a name. And we see these connections between name and purpose, between name and function throughout Ruth. In Ruth 1, Naomi wonders if she's worthy of her name. Her name means pleasant. That's what the name Naomi means. But with the loss of her husband, with the loss of her sons, with the famine that's going on, with leaving home, she feels anything but pleasant. So what does she ask people to do? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. That would be a better name for me because of what's going on in my life. And now in Ruth 4, we see something interesting. We're kind of left with this question. Ruth 4 introduces an unnamed guardian redeemer. We don't know this person's name. We have no idea what their given name is. We just know that they are the person who would be in position to be a guardian redeemer for Elimelech's family. So the question we should be asking is, is this person going to live up to the name? Are they going to do what a person who was a guardian redeemer should do? Are they going to go, are they going to look out for their relative? Are they going to care for their best interests? Are they going to make sure that the inheritance is passed on? Are they going to do what they can to provide a child in order to carry on the family name? So we see this exchange here between this unnamed guardian redeemer and then Boaz who says that he too could be a guardian redeemer. And that's where we get to the beginning of Ruth chapter 4 where we read this. If you want to follow along, it's going to be on the screen. You can follow along in your Bibles. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead, with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. So we see this exchange happen here where Boaz kind of presents the opportunity. So Naomi's looking to sell the land. You're next in line so you can, you can buy this land. Oh, but by the way, along with the land comes this widow that you would be asked to marry in order to provide an heir for this property, for this inheritance. Translation, you don't get to keep all of this. You're going to actually be want to pass this on to this relative. And we see in this an interesting comparison. When this unnamed guardian redeemer realizes he would not be able to keep it all for himself, but would be asked to pass it on, he steps back. But Boaz shows the character of what a redeemer looks like. Of somebody who functions in this way, who's somebody who has the character and the heart to carry on this kind of work. And we see it, first of all, in that he recognizes in front of like, hey, I'm not the closest one. So he does the right thing by going to this other relative and saying, hey, you're actually first in line. So I want to give you the first opportunity as I should to do this. But we see some other things as well from what Boaz does. He's not focused on personal gain. We see this throughout Ruth. Boaz consistently gives generously to Ruth. Think back to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth begins to glean in the fields. She gathers what was customary to leave for those who were poor on the edge of the fields. But he goes and he gives her more. He gives her more grain to take home to Naomi. When 
She meets him at the threshing floor in Ruth 3. He again, he fills her up with grain to take home so there's more than enough. He continues to be generous to Ruth. Why? Because it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do to care for her as Ruth was also caring for her mother-in-law, Naomi. But what we see here is that Ruth is pers- Boaz is pursuing Ruth with integrity to bring redemption to the name and family of Elimelech. There's this restoration or redemption process that's going on. Let's kind of remember the story of what we've seen here, right? Ruth chapter 1, there's a famine in the land. So Elimelech, Naomi, Malan, Kilian, their wives, Ruth and Orpah, they leave Israel, cross the Jordan, they go to Moab. While there, Elimelech, Malan, and Kilian all die in about 10 years. Now they come back. The fame has been lifted. There's food to eat again. So Naomi and Ruth return home. And now what we see begin to happen here is that God not only provides grain for them, Boaz cares for them, but now we kind of see this redemption begin to happen where the name of Elimelech had been connected with death and with loss and with hurt and with pain. We're now seeing signs of hope. There's provision of food for them. There's protection for them. And now we see the promise of an heir begin to happen. Boaz shows a guardian redeemer who is humble and selfless and focused on others. I want you to keep those three adjectives in your head. Humble, selfless, and focused on others. Because there's a greater description, there's a greater plot that's going on here that we see in the story of Ruth that we're going to see in just a little bit. But it's characterized by these things, people who are humble, people who are selfless, people who are focused on others, and then the work that God does through those people. Let's keep reading, starting with verse 9. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malan's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Ruth, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab. Amenadab, the father of Nation. Nation, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. So we see here this incredible story of not only how God provides an heir for Elimelech through Ruth and Boaz, but it's through this line, it's through these generations that we see King David. But the other thing I hope you caught here is that redemption is communal. So often we think about redemption in an individual way. Specifically, when it comes to salvation, we talk about our personal salvation. We talk about our individual relationship with Jesus. We think about what Jesus has done for us personally, and that's certainly valuable and that's certainly good. 
But the bigger idea here is that redemption, when you are redeemed, when you've been set free, when you've been shown this love, it should impact an entire community. And that's what we see here in Ruth. We see that this redemption that comes to Elimelech, to his family, to his name, to his clan, impacts the entire community. And look at this from Luke chapter 1. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he, Jesus, has come to his people and redeemed them. It's this communal idea. It's about the redemption, the shaping, the forming of a community. Because redemption has a ripple effect from the life of the one experiencing redemption to the people around them. That's the idea. That when you experience redemption, when you experience freedom, when you experience spiritually new life in Jesus, there's a ripple effect that should happen. There should be impact from your life that impacts the lives of those around you. Have you ever met somebody who has an adult, who has a teenager, for the first time in their life, experienced the freedom and the new life that comes through Jesus Christ? the transformation and the freedom that comes from being redeemed. There's this natural ripple effect that happens. I had a conversation with someone this week who's experiencing that, and they said, man, I'm so different. And I got people who are coming to me and telling me that they see that I'm different. They see that I'm different in the way that I talk. They see that I'm different in the way that I act. They see the way that I'm different in the way that I make decisions and what I do. Because as this person is understanding what it means for them, to be redeemed, as they understand what it means for them to be set free, there's this ripple effect that begins to happen. And look at the story. The elders of the town rejoice with Boaz. They're first gathered as witnesses to bear witness to this legal transaction that was going to happen between Boaz and this other unnamed guardian redeemer. But when Boaz steps up and he says he'll be a guardian redeemer, the elders of the town rejoice with him. They celebrate the goodness and the good news of what is happening to Elimelech and to his family. And look a few verses later. What do the women do? The women who had gathered with Naomi earlier. The women who Naomi had told to call her Mara, which is bitter. What are they now doing? They're rejoicing with Naomi. They say, Naomi has a son. And they gather around. I mean, I want you to picture this scene. Because I don't, I don't want this to get lost. Have you ever had the opportunity to go and to be with a first-time mother? Maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a granddaughter, sister, a friend. They belong for the day when they would get to be a mother. And then you see them when they're holding that first child in their arms. And the joy and the love that they have in their face as they're experiencing the reality of something that had been prayed for and hoped for for so long. That's the scene here. As Naomi and Ruth are holding this little baby boy, Obed, the joy and the love and the hope of redemption that's seen through this story, through the provision of this baby boy who would be an heir, carry on the name of Elimelech, and the way that we see the Lord's gracious presence in that. So I want to ask a question. This is a little bit harder question than the question I asked earlier. Is your redemption, is the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ impacting those around you? Is the way that you live into, is the way that you enjoy, is the way that you experience is the way that it shapes your life impacting those around you. Let me phrase it a different way. Do people see the love that you've received from Jesus through your life? Can they make that connection? Does what they experience from you as a friend, as a neighbor, as a co-worker, brother, sister, husband, wife, whatever the relationship is, does that show and does it bear witness to who Jesus is in your life? 
and the freedom and redemption that you've been offered. Because what does John write in John 3, verse 16? For God so loved the world. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he loves me. He loves us individually. But the redemption Jesus offers isn't just for you. It's for the world. What did Jesus say in Matthew 28? Go into all the world, making disciples of all nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And I will be with you always to the very end of the age. The redemption that you experience, the redemption that's offered to you, isn't just for you. It's something that should change your life and then through your life begins to impact and bring change by God's grace to the life of those around you. And if it's not, then something is missing. We're not really then living into how this redemption should work and function in our lives. Because what redemption does is it restores what's lost. It gives hope to people who are in pain. It gives grace to those who are in need. It gets love and comfort to those who are feeling hurting and broken. Because the question we've been asking kind of throughout the series is, all right, so where's God in this? Where's God in this story, right? We have this kind of a dark opening. There's a famine in the land. Husband, his two sons die. We have three widows left behind, hurting and broken. The author of Ruth attributes two direct actions to God in the book. There's two things that God is said to have directly done. The first one was in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. God provided food to end the, end the famine. God brought food to the land so then they would return from Moab back to Israel. And the second thing is, if you heard it, Ruth 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. The two things that we see God's action connected to directly is the provision of food and the provision of the air. We see God be faithful to provide a redeemer and to provide redemption. When there was a famine, when there was a lack of food, we see God, by his grace, provide food. So there could be food to eat. So there would not have to be this worry. To a family that was wondering how their family name might continue, where things would go, God provides an heir. And we see this happen all throughout the pages of Scripture, right? We see this story all throughout the Old Testament, this prayer, this prophecy for a Messiah who would come to set God's people free from their sin. We see this come true with the birth of Jesus in the New Testament. But here's the bigger thing. and This is why I asked you to think about those things earlier, to be humble, to be selfless, to be focused on others. It's that God's redemptive work continues today. When we think about redemption in Reformed theology, we're a Reformed church, not just because of a group of churches we're a part of because of the way that we understand the Bible, because of the way we think about God. In Reformed theology, we think about God's redemption with two words. The first word is already, meaning that God has already paid for our sins. Our redemption from sin has already happened because of Jesus' atoning work on the cross. That's the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That's already happened. It's done. Sin, death, hell have already been defeated. But then the second set of words that we use, it's a couplet, is not yet. Our redemption has already happened. Sin, death, and hell have been defeated. But everything has not yet fully been redeemed. Because God now is in the process of redeeming and restoring all of creation, calling people, men, women, boys, and girls, to faith in him, and bringing redemption to all of creation so that all can be made new. If we read the book of Revelation, right, there will be no more death, 
no more hurting, no more crying, no more pain, for the former things that passed away, we read in Revelation 21. That's talking about the new heaven and the new earth when everything would be made new. But we live in the middle. We live between the already of what's already happened on the cross and the not yet of Jesus' second coming, when Jesus will come and bring salvation, redemption, bring us to heaven and make all things new. But in this between time, God's redemptive work continues. Because God's going to continue to redeem and restore all of creation till all things are made new. And that's the opportunity that we get to do. We get to participate in God's ongoing redemptive work just like Boaz did. Boaz was a participant in this story. No, he wasn't bringing spiritual redemption. But he was able to care for somebody who was hurting. He was able to provide for somebody who was hungry. He was able to provide compassion for somebody who needed love and care. Something we get to do. We get to be a part of showing God's love, God's goodness, God's grace, God's mercy to people. As we come to understand it in our lives, we get to live it through our lives so we can affect the lives of those around us. And that's kind of the challenge, that's the call that we have as followers of Jesus, to go and to live this out, to participate in God's redemptive work, to allow God by the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us, to use us in order to share his love, his goodness, and his light with this world. One of the things that we say to our kids when they go out the door for school, it's like, okay, be a good friend. We want them to go. We want them to be kind. We want them to be compassionate. We want them to learn to share. This year, the boys starting first grade, I see them looking at me when I talk about them. They thought, hey, you know, yeah, there's, some, there's some new kids in their class this year. One of them last week said, yeah, there was someone in the playground who didn't have anybody to play with. So did you go play with them? No. Okay. But then the next day, I said, I, I went and played with so-and-so. They said, oh, you did? Yeah. Good. Because they get it, right? It's a kind thing to do. There's someone who doesn't have someone to play with. I should go play with them. Even if they're maybe not doing what I might like to do. It's a kind thing to do. It's a way we show mercy. We show compassion. What I would suggest to you is that that's not because of our parenting as much as it is by God's grace working in their life. As they understand God's love for them, it begins to shape their little hearts to go and to do what Jesus would do. To go and be more like Jesus. To go and to do the things that we saw Jesus doing. Going to those who were hurting. Going to those who were broken. Going to those who were used to being left out and cast out. And embracing them and welcoming them and inviting them in to the great love of God. So I invite you just to think about a couple things with me this morning. First one is this. Do you live into the name you've been given? I'm not talking your given name from your parents. I'm talking about these names you've been given. A disciple. Child of God. One who's been redeemed. Do you, do you live into that name? Does that remind you who you are? How you're called to live? What you're called to do? The way you're called to serve? The way you're called to show God's love to those around you? Your second question, is your redemption impacting the lives of those around you? Think about when Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin in Acts 4. They're debating with all the religious leaders, all the scholars, and the writer of Acts, Luke, puts in there, says that, and they noticed that they were ordinary men, ordinary, uneducated men. These are fishermen, but here they are with the smartest people, right, with the leaders, the ones charged to make all these decisions. But then I love that Luke includes this little phrase. 
said they were ordinary, uneducated men, but they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And that gets me curious, right? When people see us, when they spend time with us, when they interact with us, do they see us as ordinary men or women? Or do they make not, hey, that's, that's somebody who spends time with Jesus. That's someone who's been with Jesus. That's someone who's been shaped by Jesus. That's somebody who loves Jesus. Do they see that in the way that we live our lives? I want to invite the team to get set as we think about this last one. Where do you see God's ongoing redemptive work in the world? How are you participating in it? One of the things that we do here every summer when there's student ministry movement is they always go on a mission trip. They go on a work trip every summer. And I know that Thomas knows this. God doesn't show up when we get there, right, Thomas? What you get to, we get to participate in what God's already doing there. The organizations that were there with them in Kentucky this past year. God doesn't need us to show up and do things. We get to participate in it. That happens here, right, in our local community, in our neighborhood. It happens in this nation. It happens all over the world. We get to see, hear, and discover what God's doing. Then we get the opportunity to participate in it. I said, am I going to use my gifts, my talent, my time, my energy to participate in what God is doing, God's great redemptive work in this world, or am I going to do what I want? Because we see a comparison here in Ruth 4. We see an unnamed guardian redeemer who is making decisions for themselves. And we see one named Boaz who's making decisions based on what God would want. Not for himself, not to gain for himself, but so that God would be glorified and that God's love would be shown and that the name of the clan of Elimelech would be redeemed and restored. And that we would see the hope that God brings spill out into the world through our lives. And that's the same opportunity we get. We get the opportunity to have that hope spill out through our lives that the world might know Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you, Lord, that you, you love us, God, and you care for us. God, you, you provide for us and you watch over us, Lord. And God, when Ruth was talking to Naomi, she said that wherever Naomi went, she would go. That Naomi's people would be her people, that Ruth's God would be, Naomi's God would be her God. And God, that it would be for your honor and your glory. God, so may we too just go and follow you, Lord. Spend time with you to be shaped by you. To be surrounded by your love, God, so that we can go and share your love and your goodness with this world, God, for your honor and for your glory. And I pray this on the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me for one more song? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure.
you just to open your hands to receive this parting blessing from the Lord. May you know the deep love of God that pursues you, that wants to transform you and work in you and through you to share his love with the world. May you know the grace that's offered you because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And may you be led, comforted, sustained, and equipped by his Holy Spirit as you go to be his presence in this world for the honor and glory of Christ. Amen. Go in peace. Yep, last one. I'll just sing it. Ready? One, two, three, four. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will Thanks, Dusty. Thanks, Cooper. Thanks, Skyler. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Teresa.